You're very welcome to this series of videos on the February 2019 operational case study pre-scene material, which has just been launched by SEMA. And this pre-scene deals with the fictional business of Trig Adventure. Trig Adventure is involved in the design and manufacture and sale of outdoor play equipment for children. And currently it's actually having to face some challenging market uh, conditions and this pre-scene will centre uh, greatly on what they can do in the future, the near future, to recover um, some lost ground and to put the company on a steady track once more. So, over the course of the following videos, I'll be walking you through each and every aspect of this pre-scene document, all 26 pages or so, um, and we'll be talking about the main points as they come up in relation to the case study exam, talking about some of the typical kinds of questions that you might be asked on this particular pre-scene, linking the information that is included in this document to some of the key theories you would have come across in your E1, P1 and F1 studies, and generally trying to orientate you as you work through the document to make it a little bit easier uh, to understand. So let's get right into it. In the introductory section, we are told the Trig Adventure is a small family-owned business. They design, manufacture and install children's outdoor play equipment in the country of Falland. Falland is a fictional country, but we're given some clues as to what kind of country it is. We're told that it's based in Central Europe and its population is 40 million. The country of Falland has its own fictional currency as well, the F dollar. And that won't really be a, a huge uh, talking point in this pre-scene, given the fact that this business is very much centered on its home market of Falland. If it was importing raw materials and exporting uh, some of the goods that it produces, then you would have issues relating to currency risk, if there are fluctuate, fluctuating currencies in, rela uh, in relation to foreign currencies, for example, then uh, the company would need to manage that risk. But it's not really uh, the case for this business. Um, so a couple of words on this introductory paragraph. First of all, Trig Adventure is a family run business and we're told that it's actually a small family owned uh, limited company. Now, um, we'll learn later on that this company has 111 employees and according to the UK definition as to what constitutes a small to medium sized enterprise, it would be any enterprise with under 250 employees and revenues under about £25 million. Uh, so certainly uh, Trig Adventure falls into the category of a small to medium sized enterprise. We're told it's small here. I wouldn't quite agree with that definition. It's more like a medium sized family business. Um, the fact that it's a family owned business means that there are certain uh, advantages and disadvantages that come with that. With family owned businesses, you tend to get more long term thinking. The uh, business isn't really subject to the pressures of the marketplace and shareholders, external shareholders, for example, that want uh, short term profits at all costs. So they can take a little bit more of a long term view. You tend to have people pulling in the same direction, ideally. There are blood ties that mean that the top people at the company are looking out for one another, you would hope. However, uh, there are certain disadvantages that come with a family business. If it turns out that there are actually disputes amongst family members, they can actually be particularly bitter. We have seen uh, there's a long history of family members working in companies, getting into uh, all sorts of nasty scrapes as they fight for control. Um, family companies can be a little bit conservative to and resistant to change. And actually, I think there are some hints that that was the case, certainly for Trig Adventure. But with a shake up at the top of the company in recent times with uh, Tony Trigg taking over from his father, Tony has come in with a few new ideas. So they might be actually trying to leave behind that um, slightly conservative 
uh, past. And there's always a danger of nepotism with a family business. Um, you can have um, unqualified family members being put into positions of power. Certainly that's something we'd be looking out for as we move through this pre-scene. So a word on Fallland then, 40 million people inhabit this fictional country in Central Europe. So if we're talking about Central Europe, um, definitions vary as to the countries uh, that exactly go into the Central European category, but we're talking about countries like Austria, Germany, Croatia, Switzerland, Poland, Hungary, Romania, etc. Um, 40 million would put it in line with a, con a country like Poland, which is a, a population of about 38 million. So a decent sized European country. Given the fact that it is based in Central Europe, we can say that it's quite wealthy and stable by world standards. And there also uh, is the consideration relation to consumers in that country. They're likely to be quite wealthy themselves uh, by world standards. So they'll have some purchasing power um, for the products that Trig Adventure produces. On the flip side, though, there are likely to be higher wage costs for this business. So that needs to be borne in mind as well. In the next paragraph, then, we see the Trig Adventure has been running for a quarter of a century. It was started by Stanley Trigg 25 years ago. He actually recently retired and handed over his 20, 75% stake, stake in the business to his son, Tony Trigg, who is now the managing director of the business. So we can start to ask questions immediately. Mm, Tony, his son, getting the top job, is he actually the right person to lead the business? We will have actually more detail later on uh, on Tony Trigg in relation to his experience. And based on that information that we'll talk about later, uh, it does seem that actually Tony is a well-qualified person to lead the business. Uh, Another family member is actually the number two at the company, the production director, uh, Ben Darcy, has a 25% stake in the business and he's been there a long time, we'll see later on, is actually thinking about retiring himself very soon. Um, so what we can say also, given the fact that the top two people at the business are family members and they have a big uh, stake they share between them 100% of the ownership of the business is that there is not likely to be an agency problem. The agency problem is a problem that comes up when you have a disconnect between the interests of the owners of the business and the interests of the people who actually run the business on a day-to-day -day basis, i.e. the managers of the business. But in this scenario, the managers and owners are one and the same. So they're obviously going to be working uh, in the interests, uh, the shareholders will be working in the interests of the managers and more importantly, vice versa, uh, uh, obviously because they're the same people in this instance. So the revenues of the business, 20 million F dollars. Remember what I said earlier on, uh, the, according to the UK definition of um, a small to medium sized enterprise. It's under 250 employees and under 25 million pounds. So again, it seems to be under, uh, falling within the definition of a, a small to medium sized business, certainly. We don't know, of course, what the exchange rate is between the F dollar and the uh, sterling. Uh, so uh, it's difficult to say uh, exactly, um, you know, if it falls within the definition of the UK um, small to medium sized enterprise according to that uh, turnover figure being under 25 million pounds but we could probably assume that it's you know uh, close enough and um, so that actually represented a small decrease in the previous year so immediately we start to worry about the state of the business the performance was declining in the last year and we'll see that in more detail when we look at the financial statements so uh, we know the Trig is a, a private company. It's a limited company. It's not listed so on a stock exchange or anything like that. So there are benefits and limitations that come with being a privately owned business. Uh, the benefits, there is no external public pressure from shareholders chase, chasing, uh, you know, share price appreciation in the short term or profits at all costs. And there isn't the same onerous regulations and the need to churn out financial statements that need to be audited on a quarterly basis, etc., that would come with being a publicly listed company. However, on the other side, the negative side, there are limited financing 
options. It means that if you need to make a big investment to grow the business, uh, you're really only uh, looking at uh, lending from uh, the banks. You can't turn to the stock market and tap into equity funding. So Trig is limited in that way. Let's now discuss Trig's main two business segments. They are domestic and commercial. Domestic uh, relates to selling directly to the end consumer. Mostly these are parents who are buying uh, these outdoor play installations for their children. So they produce a range of wooden outdoor play equipment sold directly to the end consumer through the company's own website or um, stores in the form of outdoor play specialist stores, stores, large toy shops, shops and department stores. So it seems to me that uh, we can say that uh, the distribution channels that Trig is tapping into are, are quite extensive. The, this gives them pretty decent reach in the domestic segment of their home market. They would be present, uh, you know, on high streets, etc., through the department stores. Uh, people are likely to be familiar with their products if they're present in large toy stores, etc. And they also have the option of uh, guiding people to their website and lowering uh, perhaps some of their costs by selling through the website. Um, and we'll be looking in that uh, into the split of sales through the website and through the department stores, etc. later on in the pre-scene. And interestingly, they sell to the domestic segment uh, by packaging their goods, their wooden uh, outdoor play equipment in flat pack, uh, flat pack form. So what happens is they send these flat packs out and the people buying these um, flat packs uh, actually have to assemble the uh, play equipment themselves. So that actually reminds us of IKEA, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. You go to IKEA, you uh, see a picture of the table or whatever it is you want to buy, and it's actually uh, given to you in flat pack form. You have to haul it away yourself and put it together yourself, and it can be occasionally a very frustrating um, endeavor indeed. So um, immediately I would start thinking about whether um, Trig could look into offering the option to install uh, and put together these um, play equipment units for the end consumer and charge an additional fee. It could be a, a form of ancillary revenue. Interestingly as well, we're told that the domestic segment of the market is mature. This is according to the product life cycle, which you would have come across in your E1 studies. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a minute. But um, what's happening is it's that it's gone through the introductory and growth stage, and it's now going into maturity, which typically in the maturity stage, you would see the number of competitors reduce. There's more consolidation, costs go down, but you start to see profits and sales decline as well. So. Uh, we can ask the question now whether all of the juice has been squeezed from this particular segment and whether Trig actually needs to start looking at alternative streams of revenue. So the second big segment for this company is commercial. This um, segment uh, entails the delivery of goods that are more robust, they're better built, and they're actually bespoke goods. They're tailored to the needs of of a number of customers in the form of adventure playgrounds, cafe, gardens, schools, local government playgrounds, so a mix of private and public customers. And what happens here is that rather than selling through the website and selling through department stores, etc., there is more of a personal touch required. Trig uh, would need to get in front of a lot of these clients, have face-to-face -face meetings uh, with the salespeople from Trig going to the premises of these businesses uh, and trying to convince them to buy their outdoor play equipment. And very interestingly, this market is growing rapidly. It's growing at about 7.4% per year over the last five years. We were told that, we will be told that later on. Uh, and uh, as I said before, the product life cycle, whereas the domestic segment is going through a lull, it's in the maturity stage and will start to decline. This is in the growth stage. So we should see sales and profits start to rise 
But on the flip side, you will have more competition attracted to this segment. So they kind of smell the blood. They see the profits and they start to uh, pile into this particular segment. So that is the big challenge here for Trig. How do they uh, beat the competition in this segment? So um, the difference here, as well as the goods being a bit more robust, as well as the goods being tailored to the needs of these um, commercial clients, they, uh, Trig needs to also go to their premises and install and put together the uh, play equipment for these clients and that's included as part of the price. And until recently actually Trig was outsourcing that functionality to subcontractors and they have since taken that in-house. We'll see later on that that seems to have been a good move because the number of complaints uh, in, relating, in relation to delays, faults in the products, etc. have started to go down since Trig has taken that um, installation process in-house. There is also another step that Trig is outsourcing. There is some groundwork often required before they actually install the uh, swings and play equipment, etc., to make it safe for children to play there. So they're not jumping around on cement and falling off swings and cement. You need to have the uh, ground prepared there so that children don't injure themselves. So as I said, Trig isn't undertaking that work currently, they're outsourcing it. Again, I would ask whether there's an opportunity perhaps to take that in-house. In the next section then we're told that demand is not actually stable over the year. It peaks in the summer months, which is not a surprise given the fact that this company produces outdoor play equipment, so it's going to be dependent on good weather. Um, and there's a slump in the winter months. January, February, March. So presumably December might be a good month if you're talking about toys and play equipment because Santa Claus will be coming uh, and uh, maybe some of the kids will have uh, these uh, um, products on their uh, Christmas lists. So uh, December is likely to be a good enough month, but January, February, March, you see a slump. Demand for commercial uh, products on the other hand is, uh, does follow a little bit of a similar pattern, but the um, the falls and rises are a little bit flatter uh, from month to month. So this looks to be a cyclical kind of a business and I would immediately start to ask whether the uh, company is trying to adapt its production output according to the uh, demand uh, rising and falling, uh, whether they have maybe part-time staff to bring in when the going gets tough and then they uh, let those part-time staff go when the, um, the demand actually declines. This obviously has uh, implications for inventory management. If the company is uh, producing the same output every month, for example, they would have a buildup of inventory that would be quite costly in relation to holding costs, etc. Uh, and, uh, you know, is the company trying to plan out its production according to their production capacity and the demand? Um, all of those are questions we'd ask at this early stage. We don't have answers yet, but there will be clues presented later in the pre-scene, which we will talk about in detail. Profitability then, we're told, has been slowing over the last three years, and that ties into the fact that the domestic segment is in maturity. That's quite typical for a mature market that you see profits starting to decline. And it's pre pre indicative as well of a perfectly competitive marketplace, which there are indications later on that this is the kind of market that this is. There aren't many big companies in this space. Um, some of them are starting to die out and there are a number of small players left um, to fight it out. And Luckily, Tony Trigg is coming along with uh, some new ideas. It seems something needs to change. He wants to shake things up by investing in the design of new products. Uh, he wants to expand the range of products in the domestic market. And to help with this, he has recently appointed a design manager, Grace Lucas, who's brought from in from outside. Um, I think uh, Tony is very fixated on new product development uh, which we will see throughout this pre-scene. He seems to be bringing in more professional people from outside of external experience outside this particular industry so they can bring that professionalism to bear on this family-run business. So according to Ansoft's matrix, which you would have come across in E1, uh, this business seems to be going for product development, new products, but uh, the same marketplace. There is no indication that this uh, business is interested in exporting. Um, so I mentioned the product life cycle earlier on. 
the domestic segment is going through the maturity phase. Uh, what that means is that sales have peaked, profits uh, will start to fall, which we've seen already over the last three years, profits have been falling. Uh, on the plus side though, costs per customer, serving customers uh, will likely fall as well at this stage. And you will uh, see as well a shake up in relation to the competition as certain companies fall by the wayside and they leave this declining market. Uh, or they start to sense that there is a decline coming up and they start to leave. And uh, some of the bigger players snap up some of the smaller companies, etc. So there's consolidation. What do you do faced, uh, given this market scenario? Well, one possibility is to diversify. And for Trig, it seems to me that that would entail uh, doubling down on the commercial segment, which is in a, a high growth phase. Uh, and also in their current uh, market, as well as commercial in the domestic segment, where things are more challenging, try to stress brand differences. Anything that makes them different, uh, try to highlight that in their marketing materials to try to aggressively win uh, customers from competitors. Let's discuss your role at Trig Adventure. You are a finance officer and you work within the finance department of Trig Adventure. So given that uh, role, you are responsible for accounting information, uh, although you're also asked to perform tasks relating to other areas of the business as well. So that unfortunately doesn't really narrow things down. You can expect anything on the day of the exam. So you can expect to be dealing with people from the sales team, uh, the dispatch team, the production teams, etc. That is fairly typical for the operational case study exam. Uh, as a finance officer, you are not going to be taking any of the big strategic decisions at the business yourself. Rather, you will be assisting the decision makers at the company. So you may well have uh, directors, etc., the key people at the business coming to you uh, with some data that they want you to cast your eye over and they want you to make a recommendation uh, based on the evidence that they're presenting to you. And then they will take that recommendation and that analysis that you have done and take the strategic decisions themselves. Technical skills are very important at the operational case study exam level. Technical skills become less important as you move up through the levels to management and strategic um, because you're talking there more about strategic issues, uh, issues that affect the uh, entire business. With the operational case study, you're very much going to be focused on the day-to-day, -day, the short term and you're going to be having to draw on your technical know-how quite extensively. Having said that, you won't be asked to do uh, intricate calculations on the day of the exam. Instead, what you'll be asked to do is perhaps to look at an extract from a set of accounts or look at an extract from a set of uh, management accounts, comparing budget figures versus actuals, for example, and you will be expected to understand what they mean and to draw a little bit on your theoretical knowledge to point out any mistakes or flaws in logic. That can often be the case that you might have a, a non-finance specialist come to you and they will have interpreted figures in an incorrect way and you have to set them right. So the finance officer role uh, entails the following. Uh, the focus, as I said, is very much on the short term. Uh, you're going to be dealing with issues that have an effect on the business over the next three, six months, maybe a year at uh, most. Costing issues are going to be very, very important. Uh, budgeting is going to be important. There is a section of this pre-scene document dedicated to the budget for 2019, and we'll go through that in detail. You'll often be asked in, on the day of the exam to do some variance analysis as you look at actuals versus budget figures. You'll be asked to comment on sales variances, etc., and why there are big differences uh, for certain products, etc. 
working capital management is going to be uh, important too. We'll be looking at the financial ratios later on, the receivable days, inventory days, cash conversion cycle, etc. Cash management, this business has actually bolstered it, its cash position in the last year. So it's opting for liquidity, overtaking uh, that cash and investing aggressively in the business. Uh, and risk assessment over the short term. As I said before, the short term focus entails a period of three to six months, maybe a year at most. So there are a wide range of topics you need to cover before going into the exam. Make sure you have reviewed key theories from E1, P1 and F1 ahead of your preparation for the case because you will be expected to have certainly a pretty high level overview of all of the theory you covered in your objective exa uh, exams. So as I said before, technical skills are very important. Uh, it's different though to the objective exams. In the objective exams, you were asked to make detailed calculations, to roll up your sleeves and go into some heavy uh, technical, uh, theoretical uh, questions. This is more of a high level overview, having an understanding of the theoretical points you covered in your objective uh, subjects. So uh, as a management accountant, uh, you are expected to give advice that is not only uh, effective from a business perspective and uh, looks to the bottom line of the business, but you're expected to take a broad, a broader view nowadays. And certainly the advice you give needs to be ethical. Watch out for ethical dilemmas cropping up. SEMA loves to test uh, ethics uh, and it becomes more and more important as you move up through the levels. Um, so draw on the uh, SEMA code of ethics, which you would have covered in E1. Remember the key principles uh, of the SEMA code of ethics, objectivity, professional competence, confidentiality, professional behavior, and integrity. Make sure that any advice you give is aligned with those principles and doesn't violate one or more of those principles. And if you are presented with uh, an ethical issue, do quote the SEMA Code of Ethics explicitly. Markers love to see it being employed. It will definitely win you marks if you refer to it uh, in an ethical scenario. Watch out for requests, for example, um, to present figures maybe in an overly optimistic light to satisfy shareholders. I mean, that would be more the case for a publicly listed company. That wouldn't be the case for this business. But you might, for example, have a very influential figure in the form of the managing director of this business, Tony Trigg, 75% of the share of the shares of the business, the top person at the company. Maybe he's looking for a loan from the bank to fund some big development and he needs to present the accounts to the bank and wants to kind of airbrush the figures a little bit and maybe wants to come to you and say, look, what can we do here to present the revenue in a more optimistic light? Could we book some revenues upfront that we have for some kind of project that's running over a number of years and uh, front end a number of those revenues and you're asked to do something that is a little bit unethical. So watch out for those uh, violations. As I said before, in this uh, exam, you can be asked about anything, any area, not just financial accounting, obviously management accounting, but any of the other areas of the business, marketing, human resources, production, etc. You should have covered a lot of those areas in your E1 uh, studies. And actually, I think it's even more the case for this business that you could be asked anything because we will see later on that the finance director of the business has actually been trusted with a number of different areas outside of finance. She is entrusted with the IT uh, developments of the company. She's even entrusted with HR and giving advice and hiring and firing. So it seems to me that this business, as a small business, and it's quite typical, uh, people are being asked to wear many hats and that will affect the finance team. It will affect you. So you need to be ready for uh, anything on exam day.